Uh, my mortal enemy, the microphone. It is now 11.22 in the clock. Becky is excited. All right. So today, this passage, we got to about two-thirds of the way through, and then Jesus said a remarkable thing. Who was paying attention? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, Doug, Ken, what was it? What did he say that was remarkable? Forgive 77 times. That's, that's hard. That was not what I was looking for, but that is also a remarkable thing. Doug? Wherever two, two, or more Wherever two or more are gathered, I will be there with you. And that was important because of the thing that was said right before it, which is what I was actually looking for, but this is the danger of asking questions, <laughs> which was, whatever you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the language used in other translations, uh, there's binding, which has specific biblical terms I'm not going to get into here. But what, God is, what Jesus is saying is, what you do on earth is what you live with in heaven. Boy, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure to put on a church. I mean, it's saying that what you are doing as a church, the decisions you make, who you put outside the bounds of the church, the way that you live your life and who you incorporate with yourself will be something I respect in heaven, in eternal life. And so that is saying to us, our decisions are not trivial. Our decisions, when we're talking about how we relate to one another in a church, matter. God is there with us, trying to help us along, but they matter. They have a duration that is more than lifelong. They go into eternal life, these questions that we have, which is why it's interesting that this comes up in the context of what happens when we sin against one another. Because in this country, anyway, we are used to thinking about these eternal questions in terms of our relationship with God. In a country that talks a lot about a personal relationship with Jesus and with God, we are taught, we, we are taught to, to think about you know, getting right with God. And so that this comes up, not in the context of individual belief, but in the context of how we relate to one another is really important to me. Because Jesus is saying here, look, I'm not answering the question, but what do you do when someone does not believe the right thing? I'm not answering the question about how it is that you believe. The question I'm answering is, how do you live those beliefs in relationship to one another? And this is the context in which Jesus says, what you decide on earth will be respected in heaven. And that's why it's so important, because Jesus knew here that living community is hard. Living in families is hard. People do things you wish they wouldn't do. Sometimes they do it and they wind up hurting themselves. Sometimes they do it to help other people and you just live in this constant fear that they'll be unjustly punished for risking their lives to help other people. And that's a thing you need to worry about. And that's a thing that talks about how we show love. But sometimes people do things that make you feel like you were cut off from God's love. Sometimes people talk about you in ways that make you feel as if you're not welcome in a place and that you won't bother coming because you don't want to put up with it. Sometimes people talk about you behind your back to other people. Sometimes people run you down so much that you feel like not getting up in the morning. Sometimes people steal from you or injure you in other ways. All these things interfere with our ability to feel the love of God, interfere with our ability to be transformed by the presence of God in our lives. So we call them sin. And so what we have here is Peter saying, Jesus, what do I do when someone sins against me? And Jesus gives what's a simple answer. Go and talk to them. If someone sins against you, if someone makes you feel bad, if someone does something that makes you feel like you can't stop thinking about it and it's controlling your life, go talk to them. Simple. Is it easy? 
Is it easy? No. How many of you, instead of confronting someone, have instead just let it sit? Let it sit. Let it sit. Never resolved it until finally, two years later, it rears its ugly head once again. And then you lash out. Anyone? Just me? There are pe I'll, I'll tell you this. There are people, when I see their names on an email, I still kind of have to walk away a little bit because of things that have happened in the past. And so it's not easy to be simple sometimes. But what Jesus is saying is, look, we're together in a church. We love one another. We are part of the same family. That's not easy either. But we need to go about our interactions with one another as if we can trust one another, as if we can love one another, as if we can forgive one another. And so the first thing we do is ask this question quietly. Say, wait, Hazel's here. Um, I thought you weren't coming. Um, sorry. Uh, is ask this question quietly and say to one another, hey, look, what was going on? Because 80% of the time, nothing was going on. 80% of the time, the person's head was somewhere else. They didn't understand what they were doing, and they just said something stupid, or they did something stupid, or they were trying to, to deal with something else in their mind. They say, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. And then you're done, and you can go about your business. Now you get down to that 20% of the time when that's not what was going on. When that person was nursing some other long-standing grudge or something else was happening, and then you say, okay, we're not going to make a big scene about it in front of the entire church. We're not going to plash this person's name everywhere. We're going to talk to two or three other people. Go get some deacons and say, hey, can we have a conversation about what has happened here? For two reasons. First reason, well, sometimes having a third person, a third party involved, makes people see things differently. Sometimes it allows that third party, those third parties, to mediate, to say, hey, you were misunderstanding one another. And sometimes it makes you realize, oh, wait, there are witnesses this time. It's not her word against mine, right? So maybe I should rethink what I'm saying and how I'm interacting with it. But again, it's private. It's love. It does not need to create these huge rifts. And then there's that case, right? Nothing works. Nothing works. Can't resolve it. You've tried to do it. You've tried to do it. And then you say to the church, look, this is a problem that we need to deal with. And Jesus' answer is really interesting here. Because he says, treat them as if they were Gentiles and tax collectors. Now, in the context of the world Jesus was living in, these are people outside the bounds of the community. Definitionally, that's what a Gentile is, is someone outside the bounds of the community. And the tax collectors are not particularly sort of wholesome or welcome people. But there's a trick. Because if you look through Jesus' ministry, if you look through everything he says, a lot of what Jesus is focusing on is reminding his followers that Gentiles and tax collectors deserve God's love too. That they are not by nature of who they are alienated from God, even if they're outside the bounds of the community. So what does that mean in this context? Well, I'll tell you a story. I have a friend uh, who is uh, a pastor. She's a pastor out in, well, I won't tell you where. Um, and in a previous job, she encountered a problem. There was a parishioner who did not make her feel safe. And this, it turns out, is actually a very common problem for female pastors. That they were always too close. They always sort of had hands out. They had ways of talking that were vaguely intimidating and threatening. And so this is a problem. What do you do if you're a pastor in this situation? She followed Jesus' rules. Said, okay, we're going to talk to him first. Didn't work. Brought in some other colleagues. Didn't work. So the church got a restraining order. And what I find remarkable about this restraining order was the terms. Because the terms were, outside of the service time, the person was not allowed in the church. Outside of the service time. Why is that important? Because what Jesus is saying here is, treat them as Gentiles and tax collectors. 
treat them as if they're not part of your community right now. But do not cut them off. Absolutely make sure people feel safe in the pews. Absolutely take measures to set up boundaries and limits. But recognize the possibility that they may change someday. Recognize the possibility they may hear God's word. They may be healed if they are sick. And they may come around so that they can be full members of the community again. In our church, I don't know if we could do the same thing. This is a big church they were in. I'm not sure we could do it here. But this is the the representation of it. Do not cut them off from God. That is a decision that has a lifelong duration and more than a lifelong duration. Because the other kicker here is where two or three of you are gathered, God is here also. This is why these rules are important. We call them covenants. It's the church word for it, right? These holy agreements that are witnessed by God and God is a party to them. And it says, this is how radical the ministry is. When we cut people off because they have transgressed, not because they've transgressed against God, but because they've transgressed against us, it's still our duty to forgive them, not to forget what they have done. Sometimes this does not mean you don't turn them into the police if they've done something illegal. But leave open the possibility that they can be transformed by God because even they are loved children of God. And this is the amazing thing about this passage for me, is that we get into all of this, and we're talking about conflict resolution, and God is saying to us, the reason this matters is that I am there where you are gathered. I am in your gathering place. I am in your communities. And so my spirit is present whenever you are gathered. Everything you do in a church matters. Everything we do matters because in the things that we do, we hope for God's transformation. We are not just here in a lecture hoping to learn something new. We are not just here at a concert hoping to listen to music that will change our lives. We are here singing the concert in collaboration with God. We are reading these stories about how other people have been transformed by God and hoping that God's presence visits itself on us. And so this is the radical part of the forgiveness, is we forgive people hoping, always hoping, that they can find the presence of God in their lives that lifts them up out of the pain that they are suffering, that lifts them up out of the things that cause them to act out against one another. And this is our hope, because we are those people sometimes. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes we do that thing, and we know we shouldn't do it and we know it's gonna hurt someone else, and we can't help ourselves. And so we say, how do we want God to see the resolution to this conflict? How do we want to incorporate God into our lives? You say, I would like to be given the opportunity to repent to the other person, to be forgiven by the other person, and to feel God's presence in with the two of us to understand that there is nothing I can do to take God's love away from me. There's nothing I can do that is so great an offense that God cannot be present with me even if I am not allowed to be a full member of the church community. Because that's the ultimate message here. It's easy when we all agree. It's easy when we all get along to imagine these hurts don't happen. It's easy to say, well, bury it, we're doing something more, we're doing something more later on, but they never go away, these hurts. So what Jesus wants us to know is that we have the power given to us by God in our presence to resolve our conflicts in a loving way and to find ways that we can continue on as community so that all people feel safe and all people feel welcome. Because where two or three are gathered, God is here also. It is not our welcome alone. It is God's welcome to be in this place. So if any of you have felt unwelcome, if any of you have felt transgressed against, I encourage you, listen to Jesus' word. Simple conflict resolution. Sounds so simple. But it's so hard to have that courage to reach out and say, in God's presence, I want to understand what happened. In God's presence, 
I want to feel a full person again. In God's presence, I want to feel the love and joy that is the transformation brought on by the Holy Spirit. So this is my challenge to you. The next time you feel someone has wronged you, bury the resentment. Step away from the resentment. Get it out of your life and say, why did you do that? What can we do? I want to feel like a loved child of God again.